day, Mark. First of all, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me. We're doing it over Skype. Uh, for our audience, could you please introduce yourself and tell us where you live and work and what you do? Sure, Guy, uh, and happy to be here today. So uh, my name is Mark Ehlert. I live in Seattle, Washington, and uh, for about the past four years, uh, I've worked at Amazon. Um, the first, uh, I've had two roles at Amazon so far. The first role being uh, I was on the network learning team, which basically is the core um, learning team at Amazon. Uh, that's that's changing because it's always changing in Amazon. My job for about the last two years, though, uh, two and a half years, has been uh, head of programs in a group called the Department of Ideas. Uh, we run innovation programs for Amazon both uh, internally and externally. Very good. Thank you. Can you give us a little background of uh, where did you grow up? Uh, where did you? What did you do uh, for college? Where did you go to the university? What did you study? Sure. So uh, this is a long and winding path. I, I grew up in uh, an airline family, so we moved around a lot. So I've lived in uh, Charlotte. I was born in Boston, lived in Charlotte, uh, Chicago, uh, grew up mainly in Atlanta, and uh, then did my undergrad at the University of West Georgia uh, with a uh, major in history, uh, sorry, management, and thought I wanted to go to, to get my uh, MBA. Uh, something got hijacked along the way. And I decided that um, I wanted to pursue a degree in history. So I wound up at Oregon State University and got a dual master's in history and anthropology. And so uh, moved back to Atlanta uh, to figure out where you want to go to doctoral school and ended up working for a year as a professional historian and professional archaeologist. So I've actually been paid to do field work and write history. Um, got into the Ph.D. program in history at American University in D.C., Moved up there with my wife and uh, stayed there for about 16 years. Uh, uh, left grad school because I actually wanted a job. Um, so that, that happens. Um, and went to work uh, in the Pentagon. Uh, left, literally walked out of American University and into the Pentagon, working in the uh, Office of Readiness Policy for training. Um, basically, the shop in the Office of Secretary of Defense that helps set training policy for all of DOD. And that's kind of how I got into the the L and D space. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So, what where did you go after the uh, uh, Pentagon? So, yeah, there's about a, a 16 year uh, stay in D.C. and I worked in the Pentagon for about five and a half years. Um, then I actually became well. Then I was a consultant for Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, learned a lot. Worked with some really smart people there. And then I actually became a federal employee. So I was a um, civilian DOD uh, for a few years at Defense Acquisition University. Um, DAU teaches um, acquisition personnel within the Department of Defense. And at a conservative estimate then, we had about 150,000 students a year, uh, just government people. Uh, if you added in the contractors, we were up around 2 million. And I handled kind of the emerging technologies piece there. Oh, very cool. So is that what uh, then you jump from there to uh, Amazon or? Uh... Well, yeah. So what happens uh, is you come to this realization in D.C. that the, there's, a, there's a point in the orbit which if you stay there, you're stuck in the gravity well. And that's perfectly fine if that's what you want to do. Uh, but if you want to do something different, you know there's a time that you need to jump. And so I started looking around for places to go to. And. Uh, I went to work for a company called Social Text that uh, was one of the first companies to ever build enterprise social networks. So they predate Yammer and Atlassian and Jive by a lot of years. Um, and so worked there for about a year and a half, two years. We got acquired by a larger company called PeopleFluent that is a human capital management firm that, oddly enough, has since been acquired. Uh, stayed on after the acquisition for a couple years. And then... Um, saw this opening come up for Amazon, and ever since I'd been in school at Oregon State, I had wanted to get back to the Northwest, and it's, you know, it's Amazon, right? <laughs> and so, took a shot, and uh, was supposed to be a 20-minute phone screen, and ended up talking to my future first boss for about two hours, and just decided I have to come to work here. So, that's how I ended up here. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, you have a very interesting background, the anthropology and history thing. Always uh, intrigued me, but uh, thank you for sharing all of that. Sure. Can you uh, talk to us a little bit about your first exposure to HPT, Human Performance Technology, or 
however you refer to all of that? Sure. I, I remember this really clearly. Um, as, as soon as I kind of uh, got into the gig, uh, there was a conference coming up, and uh, it was uh, ISPI in uh, Boston. And went up there, and coming out of uh, history, a doctoral program, history is notorious for, um, I don't want to say eating its young, but uh, there's a professional quality about kind of tearing into each other. There's a whole branch of history called historiography, where all we do is assess each other's uh, methodology, research, questions, conclusions. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's like if you thought about film criticism. Um, and so I go to, to ISPI, and I remember uh, I was watching this panel on uh, myths and fads. And this is my earliest uh, AT memory is uh, there were a lot of really heavyweight people up there, people whose books I'd been reading. And Tiagi was also up there. And I'll never forget that um, listening to Tiagi and his, his brilliant accent with his brilliant humor tell this story about how insane everybody else on the panel must be to think that we could put these systems around something as messy as humans learning. And everybody in the audience was laughing. I, was, I, me- I remember looking around going, you know, are you people hearing this? this is, he's, he's a brilliant storyteller, but he's also uh, really being critical of, of some of the things we're talking about here. And, and I thought, well, this is, this is very cool. Uh, if someone like him can be on stage saying these things, I can find a place in this industry as well. Excellent. That's a great story. Yeah, Tiagi is a wonder, uh, uh, you know, the master. Right. Um, shifting just slightly, can you uh, talk to us a little bit about other HPT influences? And what I'm looking for is pointers for people that are kind of new to the field. So what other people influenced you, articles, books, et cetera, whatever comes to mind? Sure. Uh, one of the first things I'll say is, you know, uh, read widely. Um, have varied interest. Um, uh, I almost want to go X-Files and, you know, trust no one. Uh, one <laughs> of the things that, that um, trust no one singular, right? right. Uh, uh, trust but verify. So some of the people that, that um, I think were really – instrumental in, in getting me to where I was. Um, people like uh, Jay Cross, if you want one of Jay's uh, books, I think Informal Learning was really good. Um, if you want um, to stay, I think Jane Hart is invaluable. She's a, she's a gold mine. And her work on uh, the top 100 learning tools uh, each year is a gold mine, not only in the sense of here's a bunch of useful tools, but also in keeping us in our place when you see how far down the list you have to go to get to a tool that's actually sold as a learning tool, right? Uh, so it keeps us, uh, the anthropologist in me says it keeps us in our place as to we're working with humans who don't have a care in the world about ISD or Addy or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And they're using these tools to learn and we should be in touch with that. I think uh, people like Clark Quinn are great at taking really complex um, ideas and making them understandable. Uh, I think Aaron Silvers is doing amazing work in terms of XAPI. I think Chad Udell has a new book out. Um, you know, I follow Jane Bozarth and know her. Um, I, so I think all those people are valuable. I'd say also read um, read somebody like Raf Koster, uh, who wrote a book called A Theory of Fun for Game Design. Uh, it's actually really about learning. Um, and that learning is the hook in, in games. And I think um, games have so much to teach us about how humans learn because it's basically our oldest way that we ever created to learn after songs. And uh, it's one of those things that we conveniently forget uh, that is a, that's a powerful learning medium. So I think those are some you know, pretty good starting points. Um, and, and do the trick that, that I learned to do uh, back in the day, which was... You know, back when it was blogs and you, you followed someone's blog role, uh, find these people on Twitter and then look at who they follow. Look at who you follow, who I follow, and, and you know, take a stab. Uh, it's, it's free and it doesn't cost much. So, Excellent. Thank you so much for that. As a, again, as an example for new people, mm-hmm. um, if you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do, what would that be? My job is to figure out how to get 
600,000 Amazonians to surface their ideas to surface their ideas on what Amazon should do next. Very cool. Thank you. Now, how long did it take you to hone that down? <laughs> you know, uh, you, you get a job like this that's kind of squishy around the edges, uh, and it doesn't take long to figure out you need to, you need to have a bumper sticker way of telling people what you do. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. And then that's also one of those definitions that uh, when, when days get long and the work gets hard, it helps me come back to, you know, I'm doing something kind of important here, right? There are a lot of people who work at Amazon who have really great ideas, and I have the honor and privilege of trying to figure out ways to help them. Very cool. Thank you. Can you, as a lifelong learner, can you share with us uh, what your current focus is? Uh, what are you trying to learn? What are you working on? Are you writing anything about that? What can you share? So uh, I'm, I'm writing one article that's kind of in stealth mode. And it's, it's, it's about things that I see going on in the industry. And I've always approached the industry from a, a standpoint of it. I've never been an instructional designer, right? That I should, there's a disclaimer right mm-hmm. up front. Uh, so I've always come at it from a level of, of strategy. And uh, the anthropologist in me looks at how humans and culture interact with technology and figuring out how to make things that we do more amenable. Uh, to the cultures we're dropping them in. So that's still my focus now. And my focus, uh, the, the output of that is how do we get ideas out of people? And that sounds like a um, pretty easy. In fact, it is easy to get ideas out of people. But how do you get them out in a way that makes sense? How do you do this at scale? How do you do this at speed? And how do you prepare uh, the people who need to see those ideas to make decisions on them uh, to receive that, that incoming uh, deluge of ideas, right? Mm-hmm. We're not short on ideas in this world. We're short on ways to uh, quickly assess them, and we're short on capacity to execute on them. I think that's probably true, and you know, I've certainly seen it true across L and D, uh, and it's true across uh, Amazon. We're all moving so quickly uh, that it's hard to find that extra time to think of an idea or to to execute on it. So, what are what's your spin on uh, what you're writing? So, um, oh, I, I left off one person that people should follow is Trish Yule. Um, I think one of the things that L&D is sleeping on deeply is the impact on our industry about uh, big data. Uh, we say big data a lot, and here's, here's an example of what I mean. Um, Microsoft owns LinkedIn and Lynda.com and Office 365. Um, now think about it. If you've and they have their own LMSs, if you have your own LMS and uh, you deploy it, and everybody's using Office 365, which is just data on the back end, and I can run some ML that does sentiment analysis on what you're typing in PowerPoint or Word, and or even in Outlook, and I can see that you're struggling with a certain concept or something like that, without you ever leaving your work stream, I can serve you up some Lynda.com training. And what's more is I can look across your social graph on LinkedIn and find other people within Microsoft who are dealing with that same problem who might be experts in that, and I can serve them to you as well and say, here's some possible contacts. And I think there's some real danger in uh, people in L&D not following more technical developments that I think one day you could wake up and uh, just be obsoleted by. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, if we think about the, the market for um, internal file sharing before SharePoint, uh, you, I, I can't think of anybody. Now we're starting. Now you start to see Dropbox and, and places like that come out of it in a different sense. But uh, one thing that Microsoft offers is a is a uh, is a retail relationship with the enterprise. And any capability they develop, they can deploy um, at scale and at speed for really low cost across every enterprise that Microsoft is in. And I think people, you know, I, I'm not I'm not saying Microsoft has any ill intent here. I, I think they're doing what companies are supposed to do. Uh, but I think it really behooves people in L&D to become more than passingly aware about developments in ML, uh, big data, analytics, and how these things are all linking together. Very cool. Thanks. I wanted to, but before I go on to my next question, which uh, we discussed before uh, starting all of this interview, 
what are the secrets to innovation? If people are, you know, everybody's concerned with innovation and, but what kind of guidance could you give people simply about those who in the audience may be tasked now or in the future with innovation? Sure. Um, uh, let's boil it down to ideas are cheap. Execution is expensive. Um, the persistent idea is the one that wins. Um, the Kindle as an idea uh, was uh, bounced six times before it got to a point where um, it, it went forward. Um, one of the things that we do at Amazon that's uh, really different is we don't do PowerPoint. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have an express directive to not, but it's pretty clear from Jeff on down that we don't do PowerPoint, mm -hmm. that we write, we write everything. And one of the most useful tools in that writing is what we call the, the, the PR FAQ, the press release and FAQ. And so one way to think about innovating, and I've heard this from a couple of commanding generals in the Army, is start with a blank slate. And what that does is it gets you out of this legacy thinking that we've got these systems deployed or I have this budget or these security concerns. And our press releases are two years, three years in the future. And you're literally writing it as if the product you were designing is being released. Mm -hmm. And what's the reception? And who are the, who are the important customers that you're going to talk to to get those quotes? Right? Mm -hmm. And then, then after that, and I'm not giving away company secrets here. We okay. talk about this all the time. Mm -hmm. um, then the FAQs are exactly that. And they're external and internal facing. Uh, internal facing are those kinds of que the FAQs that stakeholders might have inside the company to actually deploy the product. Mm -hmm. um, external facing ones are those uh, that could come from customers on how do I buy the product, what's it like to deploy it, those sorts of things. So if there's any one thing, uh, it's, it's writing that stuff out in full narrative text um, as, a, as two years down the road and an envisioning exercise as to what it's like to see your product launched. Right? It, it frees you from a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then it gives you this way to begin to work backwards from that. Okay, so if I want to do X, what's the, what's the precursor to that? What's the precursor to that? And then work all the way back to now. And now you've got a path mm -hmm. to, to what you want to do. So I think that's, that's incredibly important. And the other thing is, is read, read, read outside your field. Do not stay. I, I love the bookshelves behind you, Right. I don't trust a lot of people when I come into their house and I don't see a lot of books. Um, but read widely, follow thousands of people on Twitter. Um, just read and, and, and take a look at what other industries are doing uh, because they have so many things to teach us uh, and so many ways for us to learn um, that it'd be a shame to stay in our own kind of relatively narrow pipelines. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I am so glad I asked that question. Um, <laughs> The, the next standard question that I have here is, is there a uh, HPT or other term or phrase that you would like to define for us? And perhaps you're concerned about how the world is using that phrase or that term, or you want to put your own spin on it. Uh, uh, give me your... You know, the, anything, anything. Uh, so uh, I, I kind of follow the Tiagi tradition of being a bit of a contrarian. So mm -hmm. I have problems to begin with, with anything that uh, goes in front of learning. Okay. So e-learning is a problem for me. Mobile learning is a problem for me. Social learning is a problem for me because it's all just learning. Uh, we're all, the anthropologist in me tells me, and the historian has the record, that we're all human, right? And, and these, these bifurcations are, are fine if you're trying to talk about different products, uh, like I have this product that's delivered by this, or I have this product that's delivered by that. But we shouldn't um, take them as being um, different from a design standpoint, in the sense that we're all going to be deploying to humans. And uh, so anything that comes in front of learning is, is problematic for me. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of stuff about social learning, and the anthropologist to me tells me that all learning is social. We mediate everything we take in through our social experiences that we've had. Even if we're doing it alone, we're not really alone. Our parents are there with us, our siblings, our peers, they're all there helping us create the social context for what we're learning, right? Mm -hmm. So understanding that uh, is, is really key. 
uh, that we're talking. And here's the other piece is, is learning as something that you can sell or box or, you know, uh, give to someone. If, if I could give you learning, that would be amazing. So let's be honest about what we're providing. We're providing opportunities and environments. We're providing content. We're providing design help. But we're not providing learning. That's, you know, that's up to the, that's up to the learner. And so those are the kinds of um, uh, pieces that, that really have, have been kind of under my skin since I got into this, mm. right? Mm-hmm. I've, never, I've never been sold a box of learning, yeah. right, ever. I, it, I don't know. If you have, that's amazing. <laughs> if anybody can sell me one, that would be tremendous. Uh, but um, I, I don't think that's possible. I blame uh, Singy for uh, all of the, our problems with our language here when everybody <laughs> made the shift in the 90s to the uh, learning organization and training organizations adopted that as their new name. But anyway, um, but I agree with you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, let's go back to some of your perhaps early days, perhaps not so early days, but that was I, I had, we had talked about this a little bit. I wanted to hear some stories of people that are in the field that you might share with us. It could be a funny story or a serious story or a, a story where you learned something and maybe it was mixed, but, uh, but uh, you, you, you have a person and a story to tell us. Could you share that with us now? Well, yeah. And, and since we talked about it, I've actually thought of uh, another one and, and there's a, there's a overarching idea here. And that's uh, when you go to conferences or where you, you, you're at events with a lot of people, uh, the hallway conversations, the the you know over a beer conversations, are um, invaluable. Uh, they're worth more. I've never been in a session that's been worth more than that conversation in the hallway. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a that's a rare beast. Um, and so, having those conversations and then maintaining those networks uh, through something like Twitter uh, or or something more is is incredibly important. Um, so I, I remember um, this is back when when it was still called Tin Can API. Uh, Aaron Silvers and I went out and we were in Pensacola at a X8 Tin Can API event, and it's one of those ones where you just you're hanging out and you're talking, you're having a blast, and you start talking through ideas, and they're ridiculous, extreme ideas, uh, but they become this this north star for you for the next five years, right? So have those conversations. Um, the other, the one that really strikes me, um, two others. Um, uh, well, so Jay Cross uh, was uh, a, a mentor and a kind of a beacon on how you can be in this industry. Um, always creative. Uh, I'll never forget. I had to do this conference. Uh, somebody at Booz Allen knew that I knew something about blogs and wikis back before it was even Web 2.0, and they. Um, they pinged me and said, Mark, can you get these really smart people in this room for this? Uh, we, we need them to talk to one of our government agencies about blogs and wikis. And so I said, okay, sure. And so my first call was to Jay. And I said, Jay, uh, can, you, can you help me? Because I knew he was just networked as anybody's business, right? Can you help me find the right people to have in this room? And so literally roll call that day was um, uh, Clay Shirky, uh, David Weinberger, uh, Marsha Connor, Jay Cross, Jerry Machalski, Eugene Eric Kim, uh, and we came within a hair's breadth of getting Tim O'Reilly in the room as well. He wanted to come, but calendars didn't work out. And it turned out to be one of these day and a half uh, workshops that just you know kind of blow your mind. And Jay was always like that. Um, I'll never forget one of the first conferences I was at. We were at a theme park uh, nearby. It was you know kind of one of those buy out the theme park nights and and go over there. Um, and Jay had won this, uh, and by at this point, this is really early in my career. I'm still a little, you know, awestruck by hanging out with Jay Cross kind of thing. Um, but he won this turtle at one of these kind of, you know, you know, contest booths or whatever. And, uh, he gave it to me. He said, you have a, you have a kid, right? And my son was like two at this point. And I said, yeah. And he gave me this turtle and still have that turtle. And it's just this reminder to me that uh, our business can be tough, um, but it's never so tough that we can't be kind. And so be kind, uh, network with people, help them out. Um, I've, I've gotten at least two jobs through Twitter and LinkedIn 
because you network with people. And I hope I've helped some people find uh, their way along there. You know, I think about people like uh, Brent Schlenker, who I've been friends with for at least a decade, um, who are still, I easily call them friends and um, could show up at their doorstep and they'd be like, yeah, come in and stay however long you want. And so build those networks. Um, and if you're an introvert, I totally get it. It's tough. It's outside your comfort zone. Um, but take the chance. And uh, I've uh, had really remarkably few instances where it hasn't been well received. Um, so so take that chance and get outside the comfort zone and build those. Even with people you, you're you kind of awestruck by or that you think will have no time for you. Um, yeah, that's – so those, those people – there's too many to name, uh, right? But uh, uh, Jay always stands out. Um, as kind of one of those models. Thank you. Sure. As kind of a wrap to our conversation today, could you share with us any parting words of wisdom or guidance for people entering the field? You've mentioned some of this already, but yeah. can you encapsulate that here for us? Be curious. Endlessly, voraciously um, curious. Uh, uh, Read everything you can get your hands on. Uh, people uh, say jack of all trades like it's a bad thing, but know 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 what someone means uh, when they're talking about um, XAPI. Know what someone means when they talk about um, you know what big data really encapsulates. Be able to roll off a couple ML models in addition to everything that you know about, say, instructional design. Forget that. Know where instructional design came from. Right. Understand the roots of the, the field that you're in. Read about cognition and memory and learning in other fields. People who do fMRIs, people who design games, um, they're all working on the same things. Before it was called gamification, it was called behavioral economics. Uh, go find books and authors and speakers who talk about those kinds of things. Um, do not stay in this narrow pipeline of of. These are the five authors I read and the four people I follow on Twitter. That's just a recipe to, uh, you know, I, I don't even want to think about that. Uh, you know, it's, it's a bad dead end road to go down that all your wardrobe starts tending toward earth tones. And, you know, all of a sudden the, the world's just this uniform color of khaki and it's just not a good place to be. Be curious. That's what it boils down to. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, thank you so much for doing this interview with me. Uh, sure, guy. Happy to. I'll see you on Twitter. Yep, you betcha. All right, thanks. Sure.